Anybody that's just tuning in, welcome to Wall Street Reporter's next Super Stock live stream for January 6, 2021. We're back with Visibility Group, VSBY, and the CSE, Jay Hutton, the CEO. Jay, welcome back. Thank you, Jack. Good to see you again. Happy New Year. Jay, happy new year to you. The stock is uh, moving up very strongly today. I think, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you debuted, what is it, at 18, 20 cents, whatever it was, a couple, you know, a few months ago? Yeah. Well, well, with, with Wall Street Reporter, right. That's about right. Yeah. So so we're at uh, 80, 83 cents today. Uh, so it's only, again, it's only 400% increase. And, you know, our goal is 10x to 100x upside. You know, we're looking for those companies which have you know the big market opportunities multiple catalysts you know a key inflection point uh so so that's and that is what's happening with visby right now i think the market's kind of waking up just in the last month and that's what i want to focus on today you had yeah um three i think really three key partnerships that you announced in december um and the last one right before christmas i don't think people really quite understood the last one because maybe now they're kind of understanding so maybe you could you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go into all the details because uh, I think things are starting to move as people see the, you know, the, the size of the opportunity and, and you know, execution here. Right. Um, I, so I, here's what I want to ask you. Uh, can you kind of give us, well, for, uh, to start off with a snapshot of, of you know, Visby, you know, the, both sides, the retail side, this, you know, this, this, you know, the, sure. the, part of the marketing side, the security side. And then I want to really focus on the big partnerships, which is, you know, really very significant. Sure. The quick, quick overview on the company's focus and technology, and then perhaps a quick review on those three releases that you uh, mentioned. And I'll try, try and do my best to contextualize them in terms of a meaningful events to the company. For, first of all, the, the, the company's technology and, and vision. So we sit astride two marketplaces that have ridiculous compound growth rates, 10 to 15% compound growth rates, both of them uh, you know, representing their current status in the multiple billions of uh, uh, of size and, and, and growing rapidly, retail and security. We are, in the essence of us, we are a computer vision company. We teach computers how to interpret, report, and understand what they see. We do this for retail and we do this for security. And in some cases, we overlap. As you can imagine, retail has security requirements. In retail, I'm looking for the movements of persons just in terms of physical movement geographically within a store, but I'm also looking for things like age and gender and sentiment. You, you might ask yourself, why are you looking for those things? The store is becoming widely recognized as a very attractive area to deliver brand messaging. Why? Because at the point of sale, I'm getting shopper geeky for a moment, but at the point of sale, you are at a place where you can buy that which is being promoted to you. So digital platforms along with computer vision measurement, and the reason why those two are coupled is because delivering a message is one thing. Measuring the effectiveness of that message is another thing entirely. And what drives brands to spend is that measurement piece because otherwise it's a fire and forget scenario. On the security side of the business, we teach computers and software to recognize things of meaning in the security context in video streams. And things of meaning in video streams might be a fire, a car accident, an individual that is wanted by law enforcement. We call it POI, person of interest. A weapon seen in public space. Crowds running from left of frame to right of frame. All these in, 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 taken together, I think people need to see the you know the you know the video demo that we've had in the past. If they see the other videos, because when they see it, they'll they'll get it right away. Because I think they got to see the. So the main the main thing I think the, the key takeaway is you know you you know we keep talking about this you know the store you know the the, the physical store that companies are retailers are monetizing that's you know the 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 traffic flow into the store the square footage of the store. Uh, with you know, really with your technologies, this is becoming like a big theme, and it's it's a multi-billion-dollar theme. It's not it's 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 a yeah. It's, a it's sat theme. it's sat in the realm of conjecture for probably three years, and our investments were the brand would come in, Bear might come in, and they might say, 
We want to try this at CVS across 200 stores. We're not quite sure if it'll do the job. It outperformed everybody who said that, you know, the best possible scenario was exceeded. So now, and that, of course, that scenario applied across multiple brands, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, the biggest brands in the world. And now without any conjecture, the store is incredibly valuable as an advertising medium. So what's happening is stores are now teaming with us and with brands to create platforms in stores that drives media. Now it's a channel. The internet's a channel, broadcast media is a channel, print is a channel, but this is a brand new channel that previous to this has been unmonetized. So there's an enormous opportunity here, of course, and that's supported by some of the stuff we've done the last 90 days, which you referenced earlier. I, I think what, I think we had somebody, somebody one of the some, uh, one of the comments early on, maybe about a month ago, somebody said something very interesting. They described your technology as sort of like a, a Google, you know, the what is it, AdSense they call it, a Google Ads for the physical world. Because basically what your technology does is, you know, somebody's walking, you know, in a store past the, I don't know, the, the, the and you show that demo of the, um, the glass front, the uh, the displays, yeah. what is it, the frozen, you know, ice, the ice cream thing, the ice cream, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the social, and you know, as they're passing by, you can show, you can, you know, basically your visual display shows them, you know, the ads, and, and it does a personalized, this, you know, personalized ad depending on the demographic. So, you know, if it's a female 18 to 35, they give them one product, you know, male 20 to 50, whatever, they give them, you know, whatever, the, you know, Molson, whatever it is, there's a, they can personalize it and, and you know, drive sales. So it's a, it's a massive. All of this made sense on paper, right, Jack? Everybody that understands this category kind of sketched it out and understood that if we were able to have a platform that does this, it could benefit by creating more sales lift. Well, then we deployed it and we discovered that our estimates were wrong by orders of magnitude. So the lift is lift. Uh, the sales trajectory velocity increases between 35 and 45 percent. Direct mail is 2%. Couponing is 4%. So we're talking about something that is off the charts more successful than anything else that's been applied. So Jay, let, let, okay, so first, first, let's do a snapshot of the economics and then we're gonna dive right into updates on everything that's happening with Mojo, sure. and with all the new deals. So the economics, the potential that you can generate per store, and I'm only talking about this retail, we're not talking about the security side of the business, just the, the, you know, the, the display side, the display ads side. In the retail side of the business, there's three critical real estate locations within the store that are valuable to us, arguably four. At entrance, you might see a kiosk format. Think of a standard LCD sign that's going to show general advertising. What we see is commonly we see the inserts, the coupon inserts are displayed at that location. So that's one monetization component. The other is at shelf in the aisle. It might be what they call a category takeover. All the coffees and we're going to do we're doing we're going to light up this light up the aisle into digital format and so we're going to drive impressions because of that. The end cap which is the end of an aisle. It's the highest frequency because of the volume of people that pass by end of aisle. It is a very high value area, but the highest value area in the store is the cooler and freezer. Why? Because it's the largest physical real estate. It's 47 to 55 inches high, and it is a destination location. We go in and we go buy beer. We want to go, we were going to buy beer. And you're going to the cooler to do that, and everything else is... You don't see it, you just go there. So the idea of driving that platform as a principal message medium is awesome, perfect, exactly what we need to do. Economics are, we charge uh, a SaaS fee for the digital display component, which is one module, we call it vision capture in the visibility world. The second one is data capture, which is all the audience measurement. This is what allows the brand to validate what's going on. And then the third is security. If the customer is interested in the loss prevention, maybe there's a bad guy that comes into the store every Friday and he steals beer. We've got our cameras looking for him proactively. That's a POI application. Each of the applications, vision capture, data capture, and vector, which is the loss prevention piece, are sold independently, separately as software as a service. Uh, we charge between $20 and $30 per month per module. And activations per retail, you won't see anything that's less than 10 to 15 in grocery. 
inconvenience store, you might see one or two activations. And so all you're really doing is you're adding those modules by the number of placements in the store to get your unit economics. I, I think okay, so I think we talked about some some of the numbers which were very impressive, like per store dollar, you know, dollar amount per store per month, because you know it's a you know, essentially you're a SaaS business, so it's it's a monthly recurring revenue. I, and you mentioned some numbers, and, and because I think you mentioned who was it CVS or whoever would be deploying, but I'm thinking like could it be broken down like on a, on a per square foot basis? So if a store is five thousand square feet, like yeah. you make out well. There's enormous there's enormous variability like there is in any new category where you see some brands diving in a little and some brands diving in a lot. You know, there's a lot of variability. But in grocery, as an example, we are looking at the average footprint of a grocery in the U.S. is 40,000 square feet, 35 to 40,000 square feet with 175,000 different SKUs, different products in that grocery. So typically we could see revenues in a typical deployment of about five to $7,000 per store just in licensing. And that's multiple brands, multiple activation types in a single grocery store. In convenience, where the footprint is smaller and the number of activations are smaller, um, you'll see less. So you might see one or two activations in convenience. Cooler, as I said before, is high value, high value real estate. So you'll see a lot of that and you'll see standalone digital display as well. So our deployment in Mexico, as we'll talk about in just a moment, is, is a single deployment initially in phase one, going to two deployments after year one. The second deployment methodology is cooler, as we talked about before. Okay, so so in terms of the, the, the dollar amount, so like, okay, so actually we got a question coming up here, which ties into, I guess, where we were going. Uh, this is one of your big partnerships that you announced. Yeah. So perhaps the most exciting deal I've done in my career. It, it is it is a significant deal for us. We're super excited about it. Um, and we have a dollar size. What's the dollar potential of this? Let's start with that. Well, we have I want to clarify there's two streams of revenue from this deal, which is atypical for us. We have a license revenue. And because we're playing a role in generating the media sales, we're encouraging brands to buy this network we get a participation in the revenue stream from media as well both of those revenue streams sit north of the 85 percent gross margin category because they're both you know they they both happen to be very high margin uh, but in the media side of the business the 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 group and we're splitting our revenue with grupo modella which is abi our local partner retelligent and ourselves we split the media revenue with them. And in the first year, that gross media revenue is around 20 million. In the second year, it's uh, 25 million. Third year, 83 million. Fourth year, uh, 100 million, 137, et cetera. So it's growing pretty rapidly. And our participation in that is 33% because we're sharing that revenue. We separately have a revenue line for software as a service, separate revenue line, not shared with anybody. That's um, we will generate between 10 and $15 per store. So in the first year, that's $100,000 a month based upon the deployment cadence, uh, $150,000 a month, and it grows to over a million dollars a month in year five. Okay. And okay, so this is, and this is just one one deal. This is like just one. It's a huge deal, yeah. but it's one deal. Yeah. It's just one. Yeah. And it's like, and this is just one region. Right. Now, what's happened because of we I, we announced the letter of intent with ABI in late November, it has really crystallized the language that we're having or the conversations we're having with key partners. We've been contacted by two of the largest ad agencies in the world. In fact, the largest who want to build this in other countries with us. I'm not projecting that that's the kind of thing we're going to do. Who knows? We have the exploration that we're engaging in right now. But the point I'm trying to make is it, it's catapulted visibility from the also RANs to now the, the guys that are building the largest digital network in the Western hemisphere, which puts us in a brand new set of conversations, obviously. Okay. So, I mean, really, you're kind of like, you know, the opportunity here really is like you're, you could be like the, the essentially the Google ads of the physical world. I mean, in other words, it lets brands, you know, target people in the physical store at the point of where they're buying stuff drive sales and you also have that security component which we could you know which we talked about a little yeah. bit and that 
And it's a land grab. It's a land grab right now. So every retailer is going to find partners or ecosystems that they'll participate in. And that'll be driven by brand decisions and retailer decisions. And we're right there in the mix of those conversations right now with one of the largest iconic brands in the world. So it, for us, it's a, it's a real great opportunity. Um, I want, okay. So, so in terms of dollar size, I mean, we talk, we talk about, you know, let's, let's the dollar size. What's, you know, like, let's, let's say, you know, you have a few more of these deals just in Latin America. Like what could, what could you be generating in revenues you know, that, you know, from your, your, you know, your cut of these deals, uh, let's, let's call it, uh, you know, it might take two years before everything is really fully deployed. In, in the two year horizon, visibility slice of the ABI Grupo Modela Latin America project is something in the neighborhood of 35 to $40 million. Just that one deal. Just that one deal. Just I mean, one deal. Okay, so. it, it's a, it's a, it's a enormous deal just to put it into context. Uh, but that one deal. And we, to, to someone asked the question earlier that I saw, I didn't address yet, which is where are you in deployment? We're deploying right now. We're underway. It's being done. Uh, it's, this is a done deal. This is happening. Yeah, we, we're going to have 1500 stores live by the end of Q1 and 10,000 stores live by the end of the year. So we're going and we're going fast. I have never dealt with a very large, large company like ABI who are acting and behaving like small company. And it's, it's, it's odd for me because I've never seen that before. They, they're not slow as you expect them to be. They're not analysis paralysis as you often see them behave as. They're moving very, very rapidly. They're feeling the competitive pressure. They want to be first. There's enormous uh, mission critical objectives that the company is achieving by deploying this network and they're moving incredibly quickly. Okay. Uh, so, so it's, so this is, okay. So this is actually so pretty significant. So, this is so just to clarify, because you know, again, you know, whenever we're dealing in the micro cap world, it's companies they they have announcements. <laughs> this is you know, there's just I'm yeah, always those. This is actually happening right now. Things being deployed. We're gonna see essentially uh, fifteen hundred stores in the first quarter, ten thousand this year, just with this deal. Um, when are the numbers gonna show up uh, in the financials? When 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 are the, when are these revenues gonna be reflected? When can we start seeing that? We're going to book a lot of 21 in the Q1 because we're a SaaS company. We book 12 months in advance and then we recognize on the monthly month, the month, the month basis, right? That's a, that's a financial construct. It's, it's uh, IFRS accounting guidelines, but that's exactly how we do it. So we book the projected value of year one and we'll book that in Q1. So I'll have a booking. So think of it as a backlog. And then I'll be recognizing revenue based upon the actual deployments that we've done on a month to month basis. That's for my SaaS revenue line. My media revenue line will be combined with others in a single cooperatively owned organization. And we'll be, we'll be pulling off our share of those revenues accordingly. And that'll probably trail by a quarter because of the accounting uh, involved in that. But what's nice about media, actually we're benefiting from both of these things. Software as a service generally gets paid for in advance. It's a beautiful thing. Media also gets paid for in advance. So we've got these two revenue lines. Good cash flow. Good cash flow. Fantastic cash flow. Yes. And for a small yeah. company, that's everything, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, one thing, I think one thing you should also clarify is that I think people are going to ask, okay, in terms of scalability, I think a, a lot of people... Just to clarify, you're not getting involved and you don't have crews of guys installing this. You have partners who do this. That's right. You're just, you're the, you're not, the business. Right. I'm not Pollyanna about this, though. I'm an operator by nature. So I sweat everybody that's involved in every part of my execution, if you know what I mean by that. So we get involved in ensuring that the proper decisions are made with respect to local installation, partners in country, and that sort of thing. So even though we don't do that, we're intimately involved in those decisions. It is the biggest challenge of this whole deal is executing on the very uh, tactical pieces of it, installing a screen, installing a camera, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so you have, okay, so that's that's Modelo. Uh, and you also had, okay, so 
the one okay so should we talk about the west rock or we got because sure. <laughs> sure, no. that deal like i don't think anybody understood what that was about that was right before christmas right, I, I will do that i want to make one last comment on um modelorama because uh this is critical and investors want to know we announced a letter of intent we'll be finished our definitive this month it's moving that quickly uh, and i had projected 90 days to finish the definitive and we'll be done this month so and that speaks not to our agility because we're agile but it speaks to their desire abi's desire to get this done and get this done quickly westrock um we've actually been working with westrock for two years and uh, they're a very large company and and just in the same way that i was uh, applauding abi for being fleet of foot and agile and small company like Westrock isn't that. They're a big company. They're an S&P index company. They're a $17 billion, I believe, New York Stock Exchange listed company. But they're, uh, they have a, you know, they used to call it in business school. This is a, this is a extermination event. They're a paper company. If you don't figure out a way to become not a paper company as the entire shopper experience is inflecting, you're dead. So they're a packaging company. Their biggest companies, customers are Coca-Cola, um, Bear. Think of all the major brands you know of. But those brands, in addition to coming to them for packaging solutions and that sort of thing, they're now saying, we want you to build display solutions for retail. They've always done display, fabrication, building custom display. But now that display jack is digital. Everybody wants to buy digital. So everything we're doing with Westrock is basically functioning as their digital arm. It's wow. an exclusive relationship. They bring to us a ton of large brand relationships that are multi-year in nature. And wherever digital is involved, we are brought in at the sale. So it's executive to executive. It is as if we're one combined team. It's very collaborative and we're helping them enormously. And so just to clarify, so what do they do? They make they make the paper displays right now in the stores, like signage? Exactly. Exactly. We've all seen their stuff. The yeah. M&Ms, the beer, uh, the light bulbs in DIY. They build all of that. And they're the largest player in the world to do that. But you can imagine uh, the M&Ms guy might go to Westrock and say, you know, last year you built for me this passive corrugated aluminum display. And now this year, I want you to build digital into it. That's exactly the dialogue that's going on. We did a deployment with uh, Westrock with Claritin and CVS. Bears, uh, one of their brands is Claritin. They have dozens and dozens of brands, but one of them is Claritin. And that was deployed at CVS. And that was Westrock helping us to do that. So, uh, you know, the, the dialogue was once, hey, we've done passive non-digital displays. We're now going to pivot to digital displays. So in addition to doing digital, which it attracts shoppers and engages shoppers, we're measuring the entire experience. So we give we give data to the customer, the brand customer, in a way that nobody ever has before. And, and a passive display made out of aluminum could never do, if you know what I mean. So that's okay. So so and so they're bringing you in now. How how is this deal working? What like what are the economics? Is it like a partnership or is is like a, how does it, how does it work? We view them as a reseller. It's a simple wholesale retail relationship. So we we sell our solutions to Westrock. They package them within theirs, and and uh, uh, off it goes to the customer. Now okay. we it's not like we lay it's not like we take our hands off and you know off off to you. We as I said before, I'm I'm an operator, so I sweat the small stuff. We spend time ensuring that it's optimized, and you know, we a paper company could never do that, right? Okay, so basically, okay, so these guys, which you know, they're in every retailer, you know, in the world, basically putting in these paper displays or what, you know, the old world, old school, and now they're going. This is the digital transfer. So with, for the digital transformation initiative, right. there they are uh, turning to Visby, right? If you believe that the store is going to become a media channel and you believe those that are best positioned to take advantage of that are the people that have been there before, like these guys, Westrock, then that's a it's a it's a reasonable it's a reasonable bet. Okay. That, that, that's the reason why we align with them.
Okay, so that's that's that's, that's pretty impressive because I mean, like, I, I, it seems like right now we're kind of at at, a, at an inflection point. Once 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 um you know once this starts you know kind of gaining traction with just a few of the bigger stores like let's say CVS or whatever, it's just going to go crazy and every, every it's going the world is going to look like a Blade Runner. You know, signs and <laughs> when we won the West Rock business. The reason I believe we won it, and some of this comes from their feedback and some of it comes from our own assessment of it, is that we, Visibility, bring to Westrock subject matter expertise. We have agency within our company. We speak and think shopper marketing. We're also a software company. So we bring this expertise that allows them to advance their customer through the selling process more successfully than they could do, than they could do themselves. So we're not just a software company, even though that's critical to what we are. We help them close business. And the best way to build enduring partnerships is to help them achieve their objectives. And that's what we're doing. Uh, okay. So Jay, um, what's what's the uh, number of shares outstanding right now? What's like what's the market cap? About right 145. Now? Market cap is a shade over a, a 100 million CAD. 100 Canadian. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm thinking like this company, right? And I just somebody made a comment that they they're making boxes, uh, boxes for Amazon. Um, you know, it's they big... do. I, I can confirm that that's true. They do. Yeah. Okay, so big company like that. I mean, why why wouldn't they just you know buy Visby? I mean, because they know the world is going digital. I mean, why won't they just give you you know I don't know well, a couple hundred million and you go away? <laughs> well, because that's not an option we've made available to them. Number one, <laughs> with you know what, man? We're 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 just day one in this journey. Yeah, we're, we're, our objective is uh, you know half a billion to a billion dollar market cap, and we believe that's a very realistic objective. Call me crazy, but that's my objective. And uh, to so, get out of dodge, yeah, how much market? What's the what's the potential? Oh, it's easily a billion dollar potential. Think of the ABI deal alone, and and attach to that the multiples that you would normally attach to a SaaS company. It's it's significant. So 10x. And so basically, the stock could be 10x from here. It could be a ten dollars stock. You see, in the U.S., 10x to 20x on multiple sa on SaaS companies all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, so, is, this is this is a little bit more difficult. I think I think this is a little more, because like there, there's a bit higher moat here than traditional type SaaS, which is just software or whatever you know, uh, you know, Salesforce. All the, this is like this is a little more. There's a lot more stickiness in your business. There's more stickiness because getting here was a lot harder. Yeah. A lot more moving. There's a lot more moving parts. There's a lot more behind us in terms of the defensible strategy, if you know what I mean by that. It's much more difficult to replicate. In fact, I'm not going to name the brand, but a brand recently came to us and said, you know what, guys? We cannot do this. We have almost unlimited resources, almost unlimited desire and objective. But we've decided that there's so many moving parts in doing a simple digital activation in retail, getting the retailer aligned, getting the brand aligned, getting the physical space, getting running electrical, internet access. Think of all the pieces. We'd rather just give it to you. And that was a proposal that came to both us and one of our significant partners. More of that will occur. And we figured it out. We figured out all the pieces. And that's a comment I made about ABI, even though I keep going back to that. The ABI deal demonstrated to the marketplace that we figured out the Rubik's Cube. We've understood the puzzle and and we're getting credibility and legitimacy because we've got that puzzle figured out because nobody thinks that ABI would do a deal with us had we not figured it out. Okay, so basically, I mean, the company right now, there is there is there is really right at this point, you know, there's a runaway to being a, a billion dollar valuation. A legitimate runway, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a big deal. I mean, because you know, again, yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of SaaS companies, and and I have to, I think I have to emphasize this point is to do what you do. The business, it's a very physical business. There's a moat. There's you know, there's like a big moat. It's not like somebody can sw switching from I don't know whatever. I I don't know. I use different SaaS things all the time. I can switch from one to the other tomorrow. I could I use an email program. I could switch from you know Mailchimp to whoever you know in, in a few hours. You can't really switch with the, with the thing that you're doing. I like to think of myself, perhaps egotistically, as a bit of a student of this stuff. I love the strategy. I always tell my team, let's play chess, not checkers. But what what I think of is we've got sustainable differentiation. 
not because of the things that we've done, although partly in technology, you got to move fast and you got to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. But what we've done more than anything is demonstrated to our major partners, Sensormatic, Westrock, UST Global, ABI, that we are basically irreplaceable. The skill set we bring, not just the software, but the skill set and the subject matter expertise we bring makes us irreplaceable. That, in my opinion, Jack, constitutes sustainable differentiation and a moat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is it's, it's almost like the old uh, thing back in the day they used to say nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM. So you're like the IBM, essentially, of this new emerging space of uh, the digital. I, I, think, I think we aspire to be. Yes, I agree. Uh, let's. Uh, OK, so Chris is asked. So, OK, so we talk, oh, we didn't talk about Embera. So just mention the Embera yeah. deal because that's very interesting. This is this. This is the displays on the coolers. Coolers and freezers. Yeah, we've done this before. We, well, we've done that in, in proof of concept modality, you know, testing. Uh, we've done a deal now with Embera where at factory, we deploy a combination of hardware and software, which achieves the objective of taking the cooler and turning that into a digital platform, a transparent digital platform so that you can see through it to the product, but you can also display upon it. It's got embedded camera technology to deliver all the uh, analytics that I've been talking about. And that's a deal that they're extremely excited about and we're extremely excited about. If you're in the cooler business, in fact, I was talking to the CEO this morning and he said, my biggest problem is my business became commodity overnight. You, Jay, and your company represent my ability to get out of commodity into the differentiated world again. That's why we're important to them. So it's an exciting opportunity for us. And we're not done in the cooler space. There's more to come. Uh, one thing is, I think one thing you mentioned, which I, you know, is, is I guess it's kind of obvious. I didn't, until you brought up, I didn't even think, is that you said that the cooler, you know, that the big glass displays for ice cream, that is the biggest kind of opportunity for ads inside of a store because it's so huge. Right, exactly. And well, it's, 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 it's big, it's physically big. 47 inch to 55 inch, and it's a destination. People go often, not all the time, but often they'll go to retail to buy a case of beer or buy a, a bottle of water. So I'm not looking at other things. I'm not looking at the coffee or the meats or anything as I'm getting, as I'm making my way to the cooler, I'm going to buy a case of beer. So because of that, that platform turns into a destination media choice. Now you can sell it as destination media, which increases the value of it. So there's a real opportunity here. Uh, let me catch up to some of the questions, audience questions here. Uh, okay, so Tony's saying, uh, do you have any? You have any um, any discussions with these uh, Loblaws, Walmart, like any anybody like that? I'll be honest with you. Even though I'm a proud Canadian and a patriot. Um, we only have uh, what I would call advanced conversations with one Canadian retailer, and it's not in the grocery space. It's in the DIY space. Um, so expect that to sort of percolate up in the next 30 days or so. Our focus has been very large U.S. retailers. And um, one of them on the list is, is uh, deploying a component of our product coming up in the end of the second, end of the first quarter, and others are part of the conversation. Interesting. Uh, that we are taking brand-led conversations at the moment. And let me make sure I, I'm clear on what that is. A brand will bring us into a retailer and say, I want to deploy this retailer. And now that conversation is pivoting to, okay, retailer, now visibility is talking directly to the retailer about creating media spaces in retail. That's when it gets super strategic. So just a note to the shareholders, how we're going to do that is not visibility alone. Visibility is going to team with our longtime partners, Intel, as an example, just as an example, and maybe some of the largest media agencies in the world who control brand budget and will develop that capability for U.S. and international retailers. Uh, th okay, so th th now somebody, I think you mentioned, is this, is this what you're alluding to, like a uh, a beverage company could they be a potential you know advertiser that, that would say uh okay we want uh, you know we want to have you know these displays in all your stores so because we want to push you know coca-cola or whatever 
Uh, I'm not going to confirm that particular piece, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that would be a perfect anchor tenant for us in the development and deployment of a media network. And they are non-alcoholic beverage companies. Think of PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, et cetera. They're very aggressive in their advertising spend, as we probably all know. Okay. Yeah, and this would and this would be really a game changer because they would essentially own a massive, yeah, they would own a massive piece of real estate. I mean, if Pepsi, whatever it is, I don't know. I don't like Pepsi. I like Coke. But I don't even. I don't actually. I don't drink soft drinks anymore. But like you know, it's it's sort of like yeah, that would be a game changer. All of a sudden, they would own that space forever. It's not like the old school thing, which is a science. Like it would and, show ads. It would show you know whatever. It would show. And it's extremely high yield. If I, as Pepsi, owned one tenth of the of the Modelo Rama network, as an example, um, and I can expect thirty five to forty five percent lift, sales lift, sales velocity, well, it's a game changer. It, it's a significant opportunity for them because we're selling that space for very attractive price points, and uh, it it has the efficacy of being measured and conducting or contributing to sales lift. Uh, okay, so what's your total booked revenue to date? I'm not sure what the, the question is. What, is it the question is what's the total? I'm... I think that's a backlog question. Okay. So um, speaking, as I mentioned earlier about the accounting rules that govern us, um, we're IFRS, which means that we, we have to follow those guidelines, which means we speak about our business in two principal buckets. Booked revenue, um, the, compos the composite value of the contracts in-house, and recognize revenue, the amount of money that's recognized on a on a on a day to day or month to month basis. On a booked revenue basis, we will exit 2020. We haven't we haven't of course released 2020 numbers yet, but our projections uh, were before in the neighborhood of four million in the booked revenue basis. And on just to take that forward in 2021, that booked revenue number will climb to 15 to 20 million, almost without worry or concern. That that much is. Is, is now pretty much put to bed. In terms of recognized revenue, I can't disclose for 2020 because that would be running ahead of the audit, but uh, you know, we, 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 we've had a significant inflection year, 19, and we're doing you know, 10 to 20 times the revenue in 20, and then we'll do that again, 10 to 20 times in 21. Okay, uh, cash out of hand. Well, again, I can only answer as of Q3. Uh, uh, Q3 was we were, I don't know, 60 days on the back end of a financing for about 6 million Canadian. Um, so we're perfectly fine in terms of cash at the moment. We have enough cash to get to an EBITDA positive number, which is exciting for me because that's what you look for. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that I should mention is that uh, we have um, a bunch of warrants that were priced at 17 cents with the with the previous financing. And those are coming in on a daily basis because we're significantly higher than that 17 cent strike price. And so I, you know, I didn't need, we didn't need that money, but we're getting that money in now, which will continue to fortify our balance sheet and allow us to uh, um, execute successfully in Latin America, among other places. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here. Okay. Uh, plans to uplist. Oh, I guess it's a little premature. I mean, for NASDAQ or whatever, but like you could do, TSX more or less soon, TSX V? Uh, sure, I don't necessarily view I, that to be an uplift. I view that to be a cross list. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, my, my goal, my next target, my eyes are on uh, NASDAQ uh, small. Okay. And, and, the, and the ILR there is $4 a share uh, amongst other things. So we've got a ways to go before we're ready to do that. But I'm a technology guy and all my career, um, you kind of kind of have to aim to the NASDAQ, which is what I'm doing, what we're doing. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. Talk, um, you know, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the some of the I think some of the biggest opportunities are, are like things which we haven't even talked about. Is the data part? Do you can you just talk about it for a minute because it's I think it's people's eyes might glaze over, but this is like a massive opportunity. This is like people's eyes do power. glaze over. It's funny you should say that, that, that because it is so sort of under the radar. Um, the the value of the data is almost nothing when your deployment endpoints are a thousand, but the value of the data when your deployment endpoints are a hundred thousand, ridiculous. For example, um, the data will be able to inform us, let's say we're fast forward a couple of years, we're 75,000 stores in Mexico and Latin America. 
I can tell you the sales velocity by gender of a specific beverage, time of day, day of week, well, AB, so Coke versus Pepsi, I'm just making it up, in Guadalajara versus Panama City. And that's incredibly valuable data to any CPG that's looking to optimize their marketing spend. And there's no other place in the planet where you can get that kind of data, with one exception. Nielsen charges PepsiCo $10 million a year for Nielsen data. But here's the problem, Jack, and this is the industry, this is not a secret. I was gonna say it's an industry secret, but it's not. Everyone knows that that data comes so far after yeah. the fact yeah. that it's useless. So look for those big companies like IRR and Nelson to be terrified of what the IoT world is going to deliver in terms of real-time data because it's a threat to them for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting because you have you have multiple. I mean, the, 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 once you're in these stores, you're making money. You know, from the displays, you can sell that data. Uh, this, this this data is, is that I mean that business alone is a multi billion dollar opportunity because now like Coca Cola or whoever you know they could see okay on a Tuesday you know let's change up the ads based on everything you know we can it's well, it, it becomes like it becomes like Google it becomes like the Google ads the digital right. remember remember we're measuring sentiment yeah so if you launch if you launch a monster drink that's that uh, sorry an energy drink that's uh, targeted to twenty five year old males like that's what you would do right it's an energy drink and you discover that 25 year old males are ignoring the display, you gotta, you gotta refit, you gotta retrofit. And so we can do that in real time. Before it used to be you spend the million bucks on the creative, you deploy the technology, you deploy the, the point of sale display, and you discover six months later that it's not doing the job. That's, that was the old way. Our way is real time. I, I think I think what's really interesting is that right now, you know, in, in ad agencies and the big agencies, you know, everybody's so used to like now, you know, di, you know, just you know, digital marketing where they can do these things in real time, get data in real time, make change. And now when they do stuff with stores, like they say, shit, this, we got we got to do this. I mean, this is like, and it's, it looks like everybody in the agency business, they're all people, you know, they're really they're relatively young. They're people in their early twenties, right? I mean, I, I would think they'd be incredibly frustrated to wait. For old data to come in, to be, I mean, this is like once they see this, they're gonna like just. <laughs> this is gonna be they're gonna push, push to have this be. This is an extermination event for the agencies as well. So if they don't pivot, and if they're not able to talk this talk with their brands and retailers, they're gone. We've already seen enormous, hundreds of millions of dollars of business be redirected from incumbency agencies to new agencies that get this stuff. So it, it's really a big problem for them. They got to figure it out. Uh, they will figure it out. They generally don't uh, have a problem when time, when, they, when they're required to do something quick. But we're seeing this right now. It's happening right now. Okay. Uh, oh, look at this. We got, we got a $5 super chat here. This is uh, Yave Cole is asking next Visby earnings date. Uh, April 30 is our uh, statutory requirement. Uh, so it'll be out by then. Okay. Okay. But, but there'll uh, be all, there'll be so much happening with the company between now and then that, you know, as long as it grows, everyone will be happy because the point is, uh, in the first four months of this year, uh, real significant traction on the revenue front and on the partnership front and on the deployment front. Okay. Look at this, uh, Jay. You got to come back here. We get we're getting these uh, uh, soup. Uh, Skippy sixty two A one. By the way, Jay, do you know this guy? Actually, because I saw this guy popped up as a subscriber. Do you know this guy has two million, like a, I think a million or two million subscribers on YouTube? Wow! I really? Look at his, he does. Uh, I think and maybe that's why he can afford a ten dollar tip. He can afford ten dollars. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's like a professional eater, competitive eating, some crazy thing. This, <laughs> this is this is really? so. So we got Jay. We bring you a celebrity order. You know, this is not wonderful. Wonderful. Only the best for you. Uh, let's Thank see. You. We got. Um, let's catch up to some couple of questions here. Um, oh, here we go. Interesting. Uh, what's the strategy behind the early traction occurring in Latin America versus North? I guess is, is you're getting a lot more traction in Latin America than North America. You know why is that? Uh, really, uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, it requires a little bit of self-reflection. 
uh, we've been we've been really privileged to find a uh, a brand that is also a retailer. And I don't want to make it too complex, but that's the first thing I said to ABI. You guys are a brand with 550 discrete brands under the umbrella. Think of Bud Light and you know all these brands, but you're also a retailer. You also own 9,000 convenience stores. Well, they're basically liquor stores, but they sell liquor, beer, and a bunch of other things. And so to find that unicorn that's both a brand and a retailer is very unique because oftentimes we're telling a story that is brand centric or retailer centric, but rarely to the two together. Because they're both a retailer and a brand, they get it and they get it quickly, which means that their motivation to move quickly, as I mentioned a couple times before, is enhanced by their knowledge of what's happening in each of the categories. So why Latin America? Because we had this opportunity with one company that really gets it. It's not the only thing. Look for us to do something in the retail space big in the US in the first quarter of this year because we're going to do more of that. Partly because we're getting this uh, spillover effect of having uh, lined up a big brand and everybody pays attention to that. So we're getting some benefit from that. Not only in the retailer space, I should mention, but also in the alliance space with large agency. Okay. So apparently Skippy, they're saying he may have a big connection with Pepsi. I think he oh. ate a lot of gummy beers. He has a connection with Pepsi. I don't know. Is, Jay, do you know this guy? I don't know. I don't. I'm sorry. We've never had a community. So, uh, let's I'm too see. old for the influencer category, I'm afraid. Uh, let's see. We got um, uh, competition. Well, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, yeah, we've got a, a bunch of va variations, variations on the question of who is your competitor. Well, we have different competitors, right? And, and, and I, know, I know that sounds like a bit of a dodge, but we have three discrete modules. We have visual display. We have data analytics, computer vision, informing anonymously about what's happening in front of it, and security, which is all of the stuff that computer vision delivers, but without the anonymity, <laughs> right? So it's person of interest, it's all those pieces. So in, in each of the discrete areas, we have competition, but nobody doing all three. And the reason why that's important, going back if I could to the Modellarama deal, is that particular customer consumes module one, visual display, Module two, data capture. And because it's Mexico, they're also de deploying the security piece. So it's a unique composite of capabilities that we offer and none of our competitors offer. I'm not foolish enough. I've been all around long enough to know that we could be emulated in that regard. But more and more as time passes by, we continue to push the envelope on our technology, which I haven't talked about at all. We continue to, to, to do more on our development, which, uh, not 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 just maintains the gap we have, but I think that it lengthens the gap we have over our competitors. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, no. It's so very. We didn't even talk about the security aspect today. Uh, do you want to, you want to talk about a little bit about you know the security module? How yeah. That be, because um, among the uh, milestones we expect to be talking about in Q1 is the expansion of our capabilities into critical infrastructure protection. Remember, we're computer vision. So anything a computer, anything a camera can see, uh, it can interpret from context point of view. So we have a place where people aren't supposed to be. It's a no-go zone. If someone goes in there, I can alert. If someone crashes the fence of an outside infrastructure, if that happens, I can alert. If a car is in, the, in a compound that shouldn't be there, I can alert. Think of a thousand different applications that the, that the camera can autonomously inform on as opposed to relying upon an operator to do that. Critical infrastructure protection is the next domain for us. And we'll, we'll start to see more in that regard this quarter. Um, also really excited about some of the um, momentum we have in the schools category. There's two new laws that have come into effect in the fifth quarter, Kerry's law and uh, BAUM's, B-A-U-M's law. And both of them connect to um, elements of security in schools and to, to, to allow for uh, real-time alerting in the event of active shooter or various types of events. Our weapons recognition capability slides right into that application very nicely. So we're talking to a bunch of providers of those solutions for schools and look for us to expand uh, into that offering very quickly. Both of those are security. So people ask me all the time, which of the two... Um, 
you know, legs of the stool is likely to outperform the other in 2021. And, and frankly, at this point, I, I can't tell you. I, I think retail is going to be crazy in terms of its velocity, but security is not going to be far behind. No, it's it's, uh, it's we have, we, have, we haven't even talked about the security that much because it's it's not it's not as big in the U.S. I mean, you know, the, the whole you know the U.S. is not quite on, but but outside of the U.S., it's it's it's. We maybe, took a break in the U.S. We we took a break in the U.S. because of all of the um, surrounding ecosystem issues and politics, but elsewhere in the world, it's it's going full steam ahead. Uh, Sam is asking, what was the feedback from Claret and CVS from digital, the digital? I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to defer on that because we've recently received a consent from both to uh, uh, publish a white paper on that, which we're doing right now. So uh, that'll come up uh, quickly. And uh, it, overall, uh, the feedback was fantastic, uh, un unheard of before uh, in terms of the value of the data. So we'll be capturing that in a white paper and providing that um, when that's finished. Okay, uh, Mitch is asking, how will you collaborate or align with major ad agencies? Well, we've got this unique uh, composite of personalities in our company, which includes uh, technology people, software people, shopper marketing people, agency people, creative people. And so to an agency, we are sort of, we, we check all the boxes. And so we will provide bespoke custom capabilities to help them understand how and under what criteria you activate digitally in retail. So when we go to an agency with that high level of value proposition, they immediately understand because that's precisely what their brands are asking them to, to bring. And they don't have that organically. Uh, okay, we got a question about the casinos. You mentioned the casino, uh, a casino initiative. Yes. Um, Hopefully some news on that in the first quarter. We're planning some activations in that category right now, but have to be a little bit um, cryptic on that at the moment. But yes, securities in casinos and uh, computer vision measurement of occupancy and mask detection and weapons detection are all relevant in the casino marketplace. A quick note on that, which makes us kind of a, a separate. Most of the solutions supplied to retail and to casino are cloud derivatives, which means that Data is stored in the cloud. We don't store data in the cloud. We store it locally. And one of the things the casinos don't want is their data leaving their premise. And retail and various privacy commissioners have weighed in on this topic as well. Cloud is, um, cloud is not ideal. And we, we, although we can do cloud, it is an architectural option for us. We can also do fully premise, which makes us kind of unique. Okay, so so Jake. Okay, so to to kind of uh, 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 wrap up here, come twenty twenty one. This is basically the inflection point, the breakout year. I mean, maybe let maybe last quarter was the inflection point, but this is the 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 hockey stick part. Is uh, that agreed. Agreed. Yeah. What's going to be you know? Let's say revenue run rate uh, exiting twenty one. You, can you make projections? With a new yeah, deal. I, 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 I've, I've, we're guiding 15 to 20 million exit exit run rate uh, for 21. Okay, 15 to 20 million, and uh, you know we've had a couple of comments. People saying, okay, 20, you know, these things could be worth you know 20x revenues, which is you know, you know, sounds sounds reasonable for especially for you know high growth, big moats, etc. Uh, so here's a question uh, from Morpheus: What value would you consider as a buyout figure? From market cap, um, yeah, I want to go. I don't want to go into too much detail, but twice in the last uh, twenty months, we've received offers, and um, we're just not here for the hundred million dollar exit. And maybe that's foolish. And in, in the fullness of time, we may discover that that was foolish. I doubt it. Um, we came here to do half billion dollar market cap or beyond, and uh, we're basically not having those conversations. You know, I'm 55. This is this is my last at bat, and uh, we we have uh, I have a management team that's also pretty uh, savvy and been around. We also are into this company in terms of real invested dollars and in well into the seven figures. So we're we're here uh, for um, a, a large outcome, and and we will make it happen. Okay, so five. So basically, something be between 500 million and billion plus. So. Essentially, it's about five, you know, five, ten dollars a share is kind of 
the the area where you think the stock could be going in the next 12 months uh, i do and and i i believe that's a realistic objective yes okay no i mean i mean listen if you're doing you know 15 20 million in revenues in, in this type of space uh why not i mean in today's world i mean it's uh you know the stock might get there faster I mean, it's gonna get there now uh okay so let's see we got questions um uh let's see we got questions here coming in um uh, no i think i think i think we're basically wrapping up okay we got people buying stock here okay wow <laughs> we answered this question okay uh jay let's let's wrap up okay in terms of news flow what do you what you know what what kind of news flow can we expect you know the next uh let's call it six weeks and we're gonna have you back for sure you know before then but what do we expect? I think we'll be talking about uh, getting to the finish line uh, with a definitive contract in Latin America. I think we'll be talking about some critical infrastructure news. I think you're going to see some uh, really, really important news uh, with one of our co-development partners. That's also uh, we're going to be announcing a commercial integration, how going to market together, which to me is really exciting because they're a very significant uh, con going concern. Um, and um, a couple other uh, revenue deals, but those are the three biggies, the ABI contractual finish line, uh, some critical infrastructure pieces and some co-development, co-commercial uh, adaptations. Okay, so, 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 so things, are, uh, things, things are looking good. Okay, so uh, Jay, to, to wrap up, you know, again, you know, our favorite uh, question here is, uh, you know, top three reasons why investors, uh, you know, should consider Visby today. Uh, well, so I've said some of this before, and, and I said it in this conversation today. Number one, the inflection point. We all look for the diamonds in the rough, <laughs> and we don't want to be too early, and we don't want to be too late. And, you know, I'm an investor, too, and that's what I look for. And, Jack, you've helped me with a couple of those, by the way. <laughs> um, so I think we're at the inflection point. Uh, we're building the largest media network in the world at the moment, at least as far as we can tell, with, with ABI. And that's if there's no other reason, that's a good reason. And I think the third thing is the partnerships, the partnerships that we've crafted, uh, both announced and some that are not yet announced, uh, really identify the fact that this company is not here for base hits. We align with, you know, we, we just we just announced a, a relationship with an S&P component for crying out loud. So we do business with a lot of big, big companies. The good news is enormous companies that view us strategically. That's good. The bad news is they tend to be a little bit slow out the uptake. Uh, so you got to take the good with the bad, and that's important for us and, and a key component to our strategy. Okay, so I mean, I think I think this is, this is very interesting. I think this is the first time that we really talked about the the the, the B the B word, the billion dollar market cap word. Uh, so the things are actually coming into you know uh, into focus a little bit. We're getting yeah. a little bit of visibility now into the 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 end game. I was a little shy about it at uh, at a ten million dollar market cap. Um, I think we're starting to get some appreciation now. That's sort of stepping up or can, catching up to what we're actually doing. Definitely. I mean, I mean, the, the the recent deals, the traction, everything else. I mean, you know, the moats. I mean, there, there's there's like a like all the you know all the important things are happening. So I mean, it's 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 really impressive. And it's and it's been happening quick. There's been an acceleration. There's a there's a pace. Doesn't doesn't feel quick, you know. But uh, you know, the strategy is beginning to deploy, and uh, that is re is rewarding to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Jay. Thank you again. Thank you everybody thank you. for watching, uh, and uh, we'll see you on the next live stream.